Thanks for the, uh, the introduction, Dennis, and equally glad to be here, to tell you the truth. Um, and I'd like to add my welcome to you all to, uh, to this year's Lux Executive Summit. Um, every year, we bring together innovators from large companies to talk about best practices, as well as some of the challenges and some of the not so good practices about making money from emerging technology, about chasing down new business opportunities through emerging technology. This year is no different. Um, this year we're using a framework though of, of partnering, of finding the next growth networks, partnering for growth that endures. In other words, that is the theme of the event. That's how we're going to frame this. We're hoping that everyone forms partnerships, talks about partnerships throughout this event and throughout the networking that's going to go on uh, and the breaks that we have. But this is also a big challenge. We're talking about growth. We're talking about partnerships. We're talking strategy. We're talking about predicting the future. Any one of these things could fill up a week-long conference and we probably still wouldn't be done. How do we do this in two days? How do we even do this in 45 minutes, which is the window that I've been given? Pretty interesting challenge, where to even start on such a complex problem? Well, like anything, we like to look at historical examples. And I didn't have to actually look too far to find a pretty topical historical example. Tomorrow, April 25th, is actually a day of commemoration. It's a day of commemoration in two countries, unusually. Very unusually, the two countries would share such a, such a day. It is Anzac Day. Uh, Anzac is actually the representation or a manifestation of a partnership. Uh, Anzac stands for Australia New Zealand Army Corps. So as you can tell, it's a rather unusual partnership between New Zealand, where I'm from, and very unusually, a friendly partnership with Australia. I can share my opinions on that. But a partnership nonetheless. The day itself, April 25th, commemorates the same day in 1915 when the Anzacs landed on Gallipoli Beach in Turkey. There was an outstanding plan, they landed on a beach, there was a strategy, we're going to advance, we have an opportunity and we will get traction and we will advance. That was the plan, it was a great partnership, it sounded great on paper. There was one problem, they missed by the proverbial mile where they were going to land. In fact, they, mi they missed by a, li a literal mile where they were going to land. Missed by a mile. And as a result, instead of landing on a soft opportunity where they could accelerate, gain traction, penetrate, make progress, they landed into very arduous terrain that was very heavily fortified, took heavy casualties, and ended up in retreat. Is anyone seeing an analogy here? So the partnership was good, the execution was bad. What happened to the execution? Well, it turns out the scouting was bad. The scouting of the opportunity was poor. No one took into account the prevailing tides that existed as, you, as they approached shore. And that was the reason why they missed by a mile. So the scouting was bad. Who's to blame for that? Who's to blame for a bad strategy and bad scouting and a bad oversight? Well, for that, I think we need to look to leadership. Leadership is the problem. Well, it wasn't New Zealand, and I'd love to blame Australia, but instead, English. Ah, always the English. That's the problem. English leadership caused problems by their scouting and their leadership. So a great partnership on paper ended up in dismal failure. Leadership. Now, there's a leadership challenge facing the corporate environment as well. In fact, there is a conflict in the corporate innovation environment right now that is driven by leadership that is causing a problem with scouting and it's causing a problem with the way we view innovation and the perspectives that we have on innovation. I'm going to lay out that conflict for you. Fortunately, because I wouldn't be standing up here unless I was providing some sort of insight, there is a path to enlightenment. There's a path to renaissance. We can solve this problem, thankfully. And then we get into taking it to the next level, partnering for maximum polymath. I'm going to describe what polymath is. I was, I was told when that word popped up in my title, 10% of the people nodded and said, wow, this is going to be interesting. 10% looked up their dictionary. 80% thought that I was making up a new word. We'll get into this. But what is this corporate innovation conflict? Let's lay this out. 
Here's a contemporary look at the open innovation portfolio. We have, all the way on the left-hand side, a very straightforward open innovation process where addressing a very identified need is addressing whether it's core technology, existing business, um, excuse me, um, legacy business models, it's finding a square peg for a very well understood square hole. This is relatively easy to do. On the very opposite end of the spectrum, there is a much more complex open innovation environment where we have to build domains, where we're finding new technologies, new business models, new customers. We're building it from the bottom up. And we have to do that through forming vast networks to understand what is a very nascent ecosystem. There are implications on this. There's increasing complexity in managing, this, managing these respective projects, and all other things being equal, there is a longer time to return on these efforts. It simply takes longer to put these things together and to realize any sort of return on the effort. It's all good and fine. What about this polymath thing? Where can I bring that in? Well, that breadth and depth, so on the left-hand side, there was breadth and depth inside the organization, tremendous expertise inside any large organization. On the right-hand side, there's breadth and depth that comes from outside the organization. We're essentially, we're crowdsourcing breadth and depth across a tremendous number of areas. Well, as it turns out, there are individuals throughout history called polymaths that just happen to be singular individuals who had that same level of breadth and depth. Aristotle, Galileo, Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Edison. If you look at the, the range of activities these individuals in, engaged in, they weren't just chemists or physicists. They were poets, musicians, astronomers, philosophers, all encompassed in one individual. They were polymaths. We're trying to recreate this in the corporate environment. We're trying to create corporate polymath because, well, at least I'm not blessed with Aristotle-like capabilities. I'm pretty sure the vast majority of people aren't either. We are replicating this type of insight by crowdsourcing to that insight. A more recent example that I've heard described as a polymath, you know, some could argue the case, this fella. Now, would I put him on the same level necessarily as an Aristotle or a Galileo? Well, you could argue the case, and it is in the specific environment that Steve Jobs defined. He actually had an additional challenge, though. Steve Jobs, or Galileo, didn't have to rely on, or have to talk about NPV and ROI. Steve Jobs did. So this idea of polymath has to be put into a temporal framework. When am I going to realize the output, the outcome, the benefits of this fantastic insight that comes from this breadth and depth of knowledge that you bring to the table? Well, we've got to manage to that. This is the portfolio we've got to look at, where things move from very recognized to very nascent. And the portfolio we're managing has to address all of these needs in order to have a balanced innovation portfolio. This is what we're trying to do. We have to, we have, to have temporal polymath to cover everything, breadth and depth at each stage of this activity. All good and fine? Sounds great, that's exactly what we're doing. Our open innovation efforts and all of our innovation efforts are doing exactly this. We have a pipeline, we're in good shape. One problem, the corporate environment is changing. What is showing up here is a list of quotes that I've collected over not a very long period of time, I would say over the last three months or so, from different corporate innovation executives. They're not from the same innovation executive. Each one of these quotes from, comes from a different person. There is a wide disparity of industry. There is a wide disparity of geography across these quotes. I could have put together five to six pages of these quotes. All right? I'm just giving you a flavor of the type of environment that is now in place in a, in a vast amount of the corporate bodies that are out there. This is pressure. This is conflict. What does this do? This is actually the corporate equivalent of a very different war-based, conflict-based analogy. This is the corporate equivalent of circling the wagons. I'm going to protect the core. I'm going to, withhold, I'm going to keep what I know near to me. I'm going to make sure it's solid. I'm going to make sure I'm taken care of. There's only one, until the threat reside, you know, subsides, there's only one problem with this. You can't see very far, far off into the distance from inside a wagon circle. You lose track of the horizon. 
You lose track of what's out there. Not a lot of scouting goes on outside a wagon circle once you circle them up. This is what the vast majority of those quotes indicate. We are circling the wagons, we are turtling up, receding back into the shell and losing vision on what's outside as a result. Is it easy to do? So for the people in this room who you know, focus on technology scouting, focus on looking outside, well, what do you do? Am, am I changing my game? Do I have to look at something different to serve the core, to bring it back into the near term? Well, here's some, some data from uh, a survey that my colleague Mike Holman took oh, around nine months ago, so pre those quotes. It's a distribution of the technology scouting activities that the typical scout engages in. This is a sample set of 122 different technology scouts. 20% of these scouts focused almost entirely on core business. 10% opposite end of the spectrum, brand new business. And then there's a mix, there's 70% in here that do kind of a mix of both. They toggle, they work between the two, you know, trying to be all things to all people. So what happens when these quotes happen, when, when we close up, when the wagons circle? Well, this 20% feels pretty good. A lot of job security in that 20%, feeling pretty solid. This 70%, well, it's pretty obvious what they're going to do. They're going to change their behavior and look pretty much at the core. Because they can. They can just move back and forth between the two. This 10% here, well, one of those was probably that quote about job security that was on the previous page. Have to pretty quickly recover or retrench whatever the activities are and come up with a new process, come up with a new value that's going to be delivered to the organization. That's a tough spot to be in. Now all this activity, all this retrenchment back to the core, obviously has impacts about where the focus goes. So instead of having a balanced distribution, you end up with, well, a remarkably imbalanced distribution where things look very short term, recognize needs, serve the core, grow my business, probably end up cannibalizing an existing business for a good portion of that activity, but nonetheless focus on the near term. Deliver me growth, deliver me growth now. I want top line, I want bottom line. Give me money, for goodness sake. I don't really care about technology. Just give me money. But there's a problem. Eventually, the threat subsides. You know, time advances, the threat subsides, the wagons uncircle, all good and fine. And then we go back out and we start scouting on the horizon again. But there's a problem. We've lost in the interim. Someone else was out there, again, using direct quotes. Found a technology when we finally went back out again to look for it, oh, it was gone. Opportunities pop up that were missed. So the corporate executive ex exclamation comes across. How did we miss this opportunity? What were you doing when this opportunity was probably staring you in the face if you were looking? Oh, we were focusing on some other things. We were worried about that top and bottom line thing that you talked about. It's a little bit problematic. But this is the situation that's set up. And again, five to six pages of quotes support that this is an overwhelming majority of corporations who are facing this problem today. Oh, well that's good. Can we get a path to enlightenment out of this? Is there, a, is there a renaissance on the horizon? Can we change the game? Can we look at what we're doing and look at what we're doing differently so that tech scouting can be used to still serve all of the purposes? Can we change the game and use what we're doing differently? Well, the first thing we're gonna do is technology scouting is now a dirty word. No one is technology scouting. We will stop technology scouting. We're scouting for growth. Everyone is a growth scout. There are probably people in this room who have technology scouting on their business cards. You are now growth scouts, officially. I will bring a sword. I will crown you growth scouts. Scouts, it will be good. Because that's what we're being asked to do. The question is, did that change the activity? If we now focus on growth instead of technology as a framework for what we're looking for, how does that move the needle on how we engage with the outside world? Here's more data from Mike Holman's survey. These are the typical targets for a technology scout. Who do the typical scouts engage with? There's a distribution here, there's some academics, uh, there's the corporate VC guys who are bouncing around in that portfolio, institutional VCs clearly delivering outsized value, startups, large corporations. The top four here involve working with academics or universities more broadly, startups and corporations. Do we need to change where we focus because we move from technology scouting to growth scouting if we want to find growth in the near term, growth opportunities? 
Well, these guys, probably not much good to you if you're looking for growth. It takes a lot of time to pull a technology out of a university and put it into a product that makes money in the periods of time that we're being tasked to look at right now. So they're probably out. Probably not as much focus on them if you're focused on the near term. Corporations, eh, it's kind of, a, kind of a wash. There'll be some technology, there'll be some growth there. But the one group in here that must grow or die, right? Not just keep the lights on, they must grow or die are the startup companies. There's no place for them to go. They can't just hold on to core business. They have no core business. They have to grow in order to succeed, in order to stay alive. So if I'm looking for growth, I'm gonna focus on startup companies. I'm gonna see what trends exist, what trends I can extract from startup companies that tell me that there is growth existing that I can leverage, and leverage in a rapid way. It's what I've been asked to do. The quotes told me so. After all, this guy was once a startup CEO. Once upon a time. Can we find more Steves? What's our progress to Steve? I want a portfolio of Steves. That's what I'm after. I want to find ideas. I want to find growth that's rapid and ideas that allow me to sustain a business. That's what we'll do. This involves a transition, though. We already know we're looking for need. We want to find growth now. Growth is really our, our priority here. But there's an ecosystem and a need we're trying to define. We're just moving around the priorities. Instead of starting with, I'm a technology scout, I'm going to find a need for my technology, my square peg, my square hole. I'm going to start with growth, and I'm going to build it out from there. How do we translate these items into things we can scout for? Well, let's look, about, let's look at this in terms of square pegs, round holes. If I have a need, I want to find a technology or a solution. If I want to find growth, when I'm looking at startup companies, I want to find a class of startup companies or a particular characteristic amongst a group of startups that have some sort of outsized momentum, anomaly type momentum that I can latch onto, that I can then use to say, how do I participate in that broad group that seems to all be succeeding versus the broader startup environment? That's what I'm looking for then I've got to find an ecosystem. I've got, I've got to have a play, right? I mean, it's all good and fine finding growth and finding a technology or a need, but if I've got no role to play, uh, what good is it to me? So I want to find an ecosystem that exists. I want to find partnerships where I fill a need, but when all the other partners are in place, where that one square, where I represent the square peg, that's what I'm looking for. So if that's what I'm looking for, do the methodologies exist? Do I have methodologies in place today that I've been using to scout for technology, which I can translate across to look for scouting for growth? Well, the answer is yeah. Provided the methodologies are in place to capture all of the information around startup companies in a holistic fashion, I already have all the information I need to change from being a technology scout to being a growth scout. I can find these just in these metrics. This is a scorecard, in fact, that we use at Lux Research. It's, in fact, a scorecard that is available to Lux clients. You can actually do searches using this. You can dial up whatever profile you want and search for the companies that represent that profile. You want high momentum? Dial it up. You want high momentum with garbage technology? Dial it up, for goodness sake. You want IP? Dial that up, too. There's a lot of dialing that can go on in here. You can find whatever you want, provided the information is in place using the methodologies that you have been using for technology scouting. Just translate them across to find growth, provided the information and the methodology is there. We can find the right trees, but also right, find the right forests. So momentum, what questions are we asking? If we find high momentum, is there broad momentum? Is a large class of startup companies all seemingly advancing and advancing for a reason that we need to understand. Is there future momentum? So is it sustainable? So if we invest in this, if we take the time, are we going to keep seeing growth? Once we have that momentum, once we have that growth, then we can start thinking about, well, how do we deliver, this? How do we deliver into this? Is the momentum predictable if we bring something to the table? Can I participate? Is there value now where momentum will come later? If I participate, do I get sustained growth? Can I turn this into something that fills some of the later Venn diagrams? Can I build a portfolio from this? And then once we have that, then we can start looking at partnerships. And we'll do that last. That's where the polymathic aspect of this is really going to come to, come to fruition. But we're going to start, because we're looking for growth, we're going to start with momentum. 
here's data on all of these startup companies that Lux Research has covered, dating back from to going from 2009 to 2012. This shows the momentum in the space. There's a you know, marginally upward trend in the momentum of startup companies we cover. You could argue we're maybe getting better at finding companies that uh, look positive. I would like to think we are. We've been doing it for a while. I'd like to think we're finding good targets for our clients to look at. Hopefully we're finding companies with momentum. But that doesn't tell me much. All you've told me is startup companies have marginally upward ticking momentum. Awesome. How do I use that? Well, I've got to break this down further. Break this down into individual domains. Now I can look at whether it's construction, whether it's solar. This is by no means comprehensive, um, and given the, the Venn diagram that, uh, that Dennis showed of, of our various coverage areas. But it gives you a flavor for the different types of information that's there. This is kind of messy, though. I don't know how to make sense of this. Show me which groups of companies are doing better against the average startup company. So let's zero out the overall. Let's use that as the baseline. And let's find what groups of companies are growing at a more rapid rate than the typical startup. Now we're starting to see some flavor in here. There's actually a little bit of, this is actually making some sense. Anyone that's participated in the energy storage domain recently will have a pretty good sense of the momentum in that space. Now I can do something with this. But how do I use this? What's my next step? Well, I want to go near term. We're in near day. Let's look for growth in the near term. What do I need to find? I want to find momentum that exists and momentum that is strong. Here are the domains that had Upward ticking momentum. Uh, Bio-based materials going through, uh, finally realizing what has to be done in terms of drop in materials, in terms of process improvements, in terms of breaking down the adoption barriers. Formulation and delivery where we're finally hitting a point where delivering active ingredients randomly is no longer seen as a smart thing to do. But the most interesting one here is construction. Construction startup companies appear to be doing really well. This goes against all intuition based on how construction has been an anchor for many large corporations who are represented in this room today. You look at any balance sheet, you look at any outlook, any statement from the CEO to Wall Street is about, well, construction in Europe and North America has been pretty poor for us recently. These guys appear to be doing okay. Why are the startups doing well? What can we learn from this? Well, let's break this down. Let's see if we can find individual components within construction that are growing and growing rapidly. And I'm just choosing construction. I could go through this process for any given domain that we cover. Break it into materials and systems. Now, there's really no differentiation here. Now, the technology's about the same. The momentum's about the same. Partnership's no different. IP, yeah, that's all good. Pretty balanced. You'll see this radar chart a lot. Get used to it, right? This is the framework we'll use to build out where the hot spots are, where the forests are, and where the trees are within those forests that can be used to identify opportunity. Yeah, but it's not enough. Show me more. What do you got? Maybe, maybe it's finally the day when aerogels and phase change materials and vacuum insulation panels are going to have their day in the construction sun. It's going to be awesome. I've been waiting for this day for so long. Not so much. Fantastic job generating intellectual property. Nice job on the IP. In point of fact, most of the momentum in this space in these thermal insulation materials has not been in construction at all. It's been in things like oil and gas or cold storage transportation. If you actually look at the construction space, the profile of these advanced thermal insulation materials looks more like this. The technology value is really not there because it costs too much. The momentum is not high. So it's not there. I'm going to keep searching, though. Where can I find a given group of companies that have outsized momentum? BIV. I did not leave out the P, for anyone that's wondering. BIV, Building Integrated Vegetation. When I started searching through this, when you run the filters and end up finding hotspots, this is one such hotspot. I could show you others. I'm not going to do it. I'll rely on you to reach out to Lux Research Analysts to talk about that. But there's very high momentum in the BIV space, a relatively low competitive landscape, partnerships that exist. Well, it's tough to get anything done in construction without partnerships, right? This is pretty solid. The important thing here is as well, the technology and solution value is not actually that great. There might be room to move in here. What's going on? Let's look at our Venn diagram. Is the growth real? Well, we looked at that. After we started seeing this pattern, we looked at where is the growth. 
This is the, the high pro likely and low scenarios that were built out by Aditya Ranada, who leads our sustainable building materials service. We're moving, at least in the, in the Americas, we're moving from uh, about 3 million square meters of BIV to almost double that number in the next four years. That's pretty nice growth. I'd like to get a piece of that. How can I get a piece of that? What's the ecosystem that we're working in? Well, the ecosystem we're working in is showing a remarkable change in the geographic distribution of this technology. So if I've got construction channels, if I've got channels to market in APAC or, North Amer or in the Americas right now, I can bring something to the table. That's a space that hasn't previously been heavily exploited, but it soon will be. My channels to market bring value in this ecosystem if I have those channels. There's vertical integration going on in this ecosystem. So those that are already in the space are doing their best to get more money from this space. So Lowe and Bonner, they acquire, who are a material supplier in the space, acquired the US operations of ZeroFloor, that is a systems integrator in the BIB space. They want to get more of that share because they see how much the overall market is growing. There's the opposite going on. There is, um, in, in terms of Ashforth Realty, who participated in the series, who's a realty company that participated in the Series B round of a building integrated vegetation company based in New York, Columbia Green Technologies. So there's forward integration, there's backward integration. For those that seem to know this space pretty well, if they know it well, maybe I should get a piece of that. And then there are new business models, post-installation services that exist. So Greensulate is a company that installs and then gets post-installation service revenues from maintaining the vegetation once it's been put in place. Same sort of business model that a lot of agricultural companies run. They're just running it on a rooftop, for goodness sake. It's a pretty nice model. What's the need? There's an ecosystem that's clearly in play. What's the need that we can address? Well, specifically design materials, there really aren't any in this space. They've basically been using materials that have existed. They pulled them off the shelf. They integrated existing materials into a new product, and that's what they deployed. Mark Binger will talk about that tomorrow morning in terms of integrating existing materials and how effective that can be. Polyurethane, polypropylene, polyamides, these are pretty well-known materials. Um, in terms of a porous media material, um, 3M's Doodlebug makes an appearance. Doodlebug one of my favorite trademarks. Doodlebug was never designed for this purpose. Doodlebug is actually an abrasive. It's an abrasive used to scrub down tiles or used to scrub down surfaces. Some innovative company out there just decided that Doodlebug had exactly the right properties that they could put it in to their system stack, into their BIV stack. No material in this system has been specifically designed for this system yet. Furthermore, no integration has gone on between the components within the system. And there's plenty of opportunity to, uh, to integrate functions like waterproofing, um, the drainage, um, some of the, uh, the, the physical properties and the strength properties that have to go into the, 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 various, um, the various components of the system. The same way that BIPV talks about bringing different components in and combining the functions. The same thing exists here, but it hasn't happened yet. So there's opportunity for integration, there's specialty vegetation. There is no such thing as specialty vegetation in this market right now. It's mainly sedum. But if we think about food security and materials and vegetation that's designed to manage water better, well, we can do that too. So there's opportunities for companies with expertise in the vegetation space. And last but not least, there's integration going on. Green wall components are now being integrated with the air handling system. So Ned Law Living Walls is working with, crane, uh, working with train and carrier, figuring out how these systems can work with each other inside the building and green walls. This is nice, right? By going through this process of narrow, finding momentum, I've now narrowed down to where I can go make money now because I've got materials, I've got systems, I can make acquisitions, but then I've got a path. I've got a roadmap that I can use. I've taken care of this, or at least one aspect of it. We'll find more. So how are we on our progress to Steve? Our progress to polymath? Where are we at? Well, we're about 5% Steve right now. That's our Steve meter. How do we build up our Steve meter? I, I want to get my Steve meter to 11 at some point, right? Well, let's move downstream. 
Let's look in the medium term. What can we find there? Well, if I'm not looking for momentum today, maybe I'm looking for momentum tomorrow. So let's look at the places that looked not so good on this big picture. Which one can I choose in here to create the challenge? I should take my jacket off and roll my sleeves up because this is filthy. How do I find opportunity in here based on what we're seeing? I'm going to choose solar. Why not? Why not take the challenge on head on? Solar is where we're going to focus to find growth, to find opportunity that any company in the world can pursue today if you know how to find momentum. Can solar momentum really be used in the same sentence? And that's, um, that's got to be oxymoronic in some way, shape, or form, right? I mean, you just got to look at the carnage that's been out in this space. And it's across the environment. It's crystalline silicon starters, amorphous silicon. Oh, and <laughs> organic photovoltaics were never going to escape this carnage, right? That was a given. Um, but even the recent financial tribulations in China, yeah, they're starting to pay for their sins as well, right? Um, Large, reputable players have fallen amok of the solar buzzsaw and pulled out or retranced, in Sharp Solar's case, shut down all the amorphous silicon activities that were going on, focusing back to truly innovative and high efficiency products instead of the commoditized approach, which was really the approach that kind of was the mistake most of these companies made. Even the undisputed heavyweight champion of the fast followers ran amok of the solar buzzsaw making an ill-advised investment in polycrystal and silicon, and now retrenching back into SIGs, thin film SIGs technology. So this is an indiscriminate litany of carnage that's gone on here. But we are going to find momentum. We are going to find something that we can use. Look, even the VC guys are running to the hills here. This is uh, data taken from a friend of Lux, Matthew Norton. Um, this is clean tech VC investing over the last two years. Uh, you could regard solar as a poster child for what is first time or even follow on funding. The VC guys are running for the hills as well, back to the IT mothership, most of them. Good news is when the stupid money leaves, the smart money can get value. That's the good news. So where can we find value in this system? Here's the downstream portion of the, of the, of the solar value chain. I could have looked at upstream, I could have looked at encapsulants and cell technology and wafering technologies. There would have been stuff in there as well, but we're going to focus on downstream. This seems like fun. There'll be some value here. That's what the downstream looks like, a, an aggregation of module manufacturers, inverter manufacturers, installers, anything that's past the cell. That's what we've encapsulated in here in the same radar plot that we're looking at. Not a lot to speak of in there. I'm using this, you'll notice I'm using these same axes, so if you know, you're wondering if I'm playing games with that, everything starts at two and finishes with four, right? just to get the, get the gauge in place. When we start poking through this and start pulling out taxonomy, start identifying companies that have outsized momentum, the inverter companies start to bubble up to the top. We start to pull them out of what is a broader environment. Yeah, inverters, nice, okay. Can you tell me anything more? Inverters, that's, that's pretty broad. I don't know where to go, what to do, what geography, what application. Well, maybe we should start looking at applications. What about microinverters? You could argue the momentum's kind of down in the noise. You know, I'm a Six Sigma guy from the past. You know, don't give me statistical significance. The competitive landscape looks interesting, though, and the IP position looks pretty interesting, too, from a defendable rate. But can I make sense of that momentum? If, how can I prove that maybe microinverters have outsized momentum versus typical inverters? Well, let's look at where microinverters might play. How's the distributed generation profile looking? How are the installers doing? in the distributed generation space. Oh, now we're talking. There's something going on here. Again, I've found some momentum from what looked like a hideous situation. Someone seems to be doing well. And what's more, some of the technology that appears to feed into that person doing well appears to be doing well too. Can I find something in here? What do I do? What's my play? Let's go back to our Venn diagram. Is there growth? Yeah, there's growth. This is the distributed, this is the growth in PV installations that's projected out to 2018 by my colleague Matt Feinstein and his colleagues. And you can see in the developed nations, distributed generation, both residential and commercial, will grow and will be an outsized proportion of the market in these developed nations where the vast majority of people in this audience had the vast majority of their business. So there's growth. I like the look of this. 
yeah, but can I play? Is this just the same garbage commoditized stuff that has caused all the carnage in the solar space already? Am I walking into a buzzsaw again? You're walking me into the lowest margin business in the history of my company, outside of maybe fuel cells. Well, we've got to understand the ecosystem for that. Is there money in this ecosystem? How is this system operating? Well, the most important thing that's happened in this ecosystem is financial innovation. The onset of PPAs, particularly in the North American market, which are proliferating in other parts of the world as well, are starting to grow in terms of business model, has enabled this system to grow, and particularly in the residential space, to grow at a rapid rate. The consumer no longer pays up front for the capex, they pay for the electricity, and what's more, they pay 15% less for the electricity. That is their price of entry. Negative price of entry. And it's all fueled by the financiers who have found business models under which they can offer electricity below retail rate and still make money. It's also enabling, because they're making money, it's also enabling them to adopt higher performing, higher cost, but higher revenue generating technologies. So if we run the LCOE calculation for these much higher performing technologies, they can play in the residential space that we've already seen has grown at a remarkably rate. This is not that commodity garbage that caused so much carnage out in the environment. This is innovation. This is technology that's being adopted through financial innovation that's deploying it and growing at a rapid rate based on that momentum. How can we see this? Well, let's use uh, Enphase as an example. A startup company, essentially the poster child for micro-inverter startups, it's fair to say. In four years, they've grown to about 30% penetration in California's residential solar space from a startup company. No brand, no credibility, questionable warranties, given you know, how much can you rely on from a warranty from a startup company anyway. And they've grown to 30% in the California market. They've managed to pull it off and it's using a higher cost, but higher performing technology. How did this work? I thought this was a commodity space. Someone told me some solar was just garbage and no one was making money. These guys are doing all right. But we're not done there. Not only can microinverters being commercialized, we can now look to a path in which we can develop a new need. So taking silicon carbide or gallium nitride power electronics, we can add additional money, a premium on top of the silicon-based electronics and inverters that might be out there. I can go and find you another 14 cents a watt by adopting this technology, by putting this advanced power electronics technology in inverters. So there's a path to development that doesn't stop with Enphase. It only keeps going with the technology that large corporations are perfectly positioned to develop. So I can now find you growth in solar, and I can find you a need that exists. Am I the only person seeing this? Well, no. There's a reason why Advanced Energy bought Refusol. US-based, utility-scale inverter manufacturer bought a German-based, distributed generation-focused inverter manufacturer because they knew that distributed generation space in the US was growing. Yeah, great. Hindsight's 2020. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for telling me what I've missed out on. Awesome. Can you tell me a place where I can actually do something? Can you, can you show me anything? Yeah, I can. That's the good news. There's a path to enlightenment here. I can use exactly the same metrics that we you know, use to identify a forest, a high growth forest, and start picking out individual trees within that forest that I can use. So using the same metrics, I can dial up what I want. I want high technology. I'd like to see an IP position, IP position that works. I kind of want them to have garbage partnerships, actually. You know, show me a little bit of garbage on the partnership side, but show me some solid momentum. Is there any company that fits this profile in the microinverter space that I can acquire? Wow, you dial it up, you know, pull it into the computer, and that's, well, you end up with a ray power pops up as one of the companies. Certainly not the only one, but it fits all of those metrics. High technology, good momentum, good IP, looking for partners. If you're looking for the next refusal, ray power might fit the picture. That's the way to go down from this idea of scouting for growth to finding the forests and then identifying the trees that will allow large companies to participate. If anyone is wondering if this is just an inverter phenomenon and not a module phenomenon, I invite you to ask Matt Feinstein about why First Solar bought Tetrasun, a scrubby startup working on N-doped silicon cell technology. 
Why would they do that? Because Tetrasun has a great product for the residential market. Plenty of others out there as well. Great. Now we've taken care of the middle thing. How close am I to, what's, where's my Steve meter? Tell me where my Steve meter is. Got to know where I am to Steve. Yeah, well, still a long way to Steve. Long way to go to Steve. So we can fill this out, right? Let's, let's do the obvious thing. Let's work downstream. I, I know what I've got to do. I've got to go long term. Tell me about long term. No, that's not my job. Mark Binger's job is to tell you about long term tomorrow. Mark Binger will be out there tomorrow. Indeed, Mark Binger is out there. <laughs> you will find this out tomorrow. To be a true polymath, well, we've got to think orthogonally. Let's change the angle of attack in here. Let's talk about an ecosystem, an ecosystem that might operate. China's a pretty good ecosystem. It's growing today, it's going to grow tomorrow, it's going to grow after that. I can assure you that 1.3 billion people, are, that's a pretty solid market. I think I can plan that. I think there's probably some opportunity. What's the ecosystem? Well, there's construction, there's healthcare expenditures that are going up, the lithium-ion battery market is going up, They've got a shale gas play, and what's more, it's a shale gas play which they're allowing foreign companies to participate in now. That's pretty nice. Go and find some opportunity inside China in, in shale gas. Nice play. So there's growth. Let's compare Chinese startups to global startup companies. What do we see? Same chart, right? Probably not a lot of surprise in here. Um, in terms of technology value, yeah, Chinese startup companies, not quite so good. Not particularly insightful. Momentum, a little bit higher. Chinese government could do amazing things when they want to support a startup company. IP position, yeah, that's the one that everyone's going, yeah, told you so. I told you no one cares about IP in that country. No. It's a broad environment, but can we isolate this down to specific domains where this is not the same picture, where we can find value that looks more comfortable and more familiar? Same exercise. Let's take these Chinese startups and break them into individual components, individual technology areas. What do we see? Well, we see a gamish of different activity. You're not telling me much. But we can look at a couple. Let's make this a little bit simpler. You can ask any of our analysts about their specific areas in China. They'll tell you what's going on. There are extremes in here. Um, at one extreme, the grid and EV space. Yeah, it's not particularly, not the strongest in China, it's fair to say. Again, not delivering a lot of insightful value to anyone in the audience who's in this space. You know, the energy storage market there, or the energy storage technology there, not that great. The biotech and pharma space on the, other, on the other hand, oh, now there's something going on. I can find technology, I can find momentum, I can find partnerships. This starts to look a lot like an environment I want to play in. It's no surprise either, this was one of the first areas that China really invested heavily in in terms of internal R&D capability, domestic R&D capability, back in the early 90s. These are the fruits of those early investments, 20 years later. That's what we're looking at. But where does it go? If biotech is where you want me to play, I've, we've, we've walked through how to operate in the near term. What does this mean in terms of the long term? How does this play forward? Well, let's use R&D funding as a proxy. If we know R&D spending 20, that started 20 years ago gave us this result, where's R&D spending going? Well, look at what's happening comparing the 11th and 12th five-year plans. Biotech and advanced agriculture get an outsized proportion of the funding in China. So whatever momentum, momentum, exists, momentum exists already, whatever technology exists already, is probably only going to proliferate as an outcome of the expenditures that are now going to place. That just reinforces where I want to play in this biotech space. But I've got to know where this R&D funding is going if I want to identify partners, if I want to identify partners for future growth. There are many R&D programs and government funding programs in China to understand. There's anywhere from the, the National Science Foundation, there's the National Science and Technology major programs at the opposite end. The two primary ones I'll focus on at the national level are the 973 and 863 programs, which we can go into more detail, detail on, but it would take hours. The basics you need to know. 973, basic research, no industry match, no industry matching required. 863 programs. Applied research focus, probably going to be closer to market, closer to commercialization, industry matching funding required. There is a pipeline here. I can show you technologies that were once 973 technologies that are now 863 technologies. So there is a path to this. There's a way that this develops. So where do we want to focus? I could use 973 if I want to go long term. Ah, let's look at 863. What can we identify in there? Application focused research comparing Chinese startup companies to those Chinese startup companies that are attached to 863 or in some way have a relationship to 863 programs. This is the difference in terms of the data that we see. 
better technology, better intellectual property, higher momentum and better partnerships. They know people, they got funding. They have industry connections by definition, right? They have academic connections by definition. Their technology is better because it was invested in. Their IP is better because they're required to look at IP under these 863 programs. What if I want to go earlier stage, not the startups, but maybe labs where some of this technology is even earlier stage that have industry partners? Well, let's look at 863 technology that's coming out of the Chinese academies of sciences. Now we're getting even greater technology value. The momentum's still there, the partnership's not so much. Technology's not commercialized yet. Still early stage, right? Haven't built the same level of partnerships. So we know 863 is strong. What about the funding? Let's combine this biotech hotspot with 863. Now we can track it down. Now I know, well, where's the funding going? Where should I operate? Best thing about China is they tell you exactly what they're gonna do. It's not hard to scout. It's really not when you take the time. So here are the hotspots that combine biotech, which we know is a today hotspot, with 863, which we know is a tomorrow hotspot. Forests and good, good trees and good forests. Best news is, as of about 12 months ago, foreign companies could participate in these 863 programs. They changed the regulation to allow overseas companies to work with universities and institutions inside China. You have access. One such example, once we know this, ah, the Suzhou Industry Park and specifically BioBay, a center of 863 excellence. Numerous 863 programs, high patent activity, and someone already took notice with Roche and Harvard already setting up their own incubator inside BioBay, recognizing this hotspot that exists. Wow, this is pretty nice, right? I've shown different paths to get to growth. There's a range of different angles we can take just by using the same methodologies that we've been using for tech scouting and applying them to instead focus on growth in the near, the medium, and the long term. So you've shown that there's growth. There's a way to scout for growth. What about this partnering thing? How do we partner to maximize our visibility? How do we put an accelerator on finding these growth opportunities so that we don't have to go through the same exercise independently? We can rely on our network to also scout for those trees and scout for those forests. This is partnering to maximum vision. Maximum breadth, maximum depth, maximum polymath. Let's maximize our Steve. Let's take it to the next level. What are we gonna do? Well, three simple, I'll attack this at three simple levels. The institutional polymath, the startup polymath, the corporate polymath. What are we talking about? How can we accelerate? What's this broader network we can build? Well, we talked about technology, we talked about partnerships. The questions we wanna ask here, do they have a gap we can fill? That's the near term need. Do they have partners that add to our network? That is where the true polymathic view comes in. What's their partner network like? What can we learn from them that they're learning from their partners? We're talking degrees of separation here. It's not what you know, it's what they know that you can learn from. After all, to build out this domain, it's not just about finding the one degree of separation, it's about finding the partners that are two steps out if we really wanna find true growth. So how do we do this? Institutional level, let's go back to 863. Institutional partnership polymath. Using 863 committees to identify where good partners might be. These are the committee members that decide who gets the 863 funding. Do you think they know some people? Do you think perhaps by partnering with them, by working with them, building relationships with them, you in turn get a view of who are the academics, who are the industry partners, and who are the policy makers that are determining where 863 funding maybe should go in a certain direction? It's not about direct partnership, it's about building those partnerships to get to that true long-term polymathic view, that breadth and depth we talked about. Startup, polyship, um, startup partnership mapping. This Trojan horse idea that was coined by my colleague uh, Jonathan Melnick who leads our printed flexible and organic electronics service. That's a mouthful. Previously, um, in established electronics applications, the typical behavior was for startups to try and find large companies, whether it be in materials or manufacturing, who would then work with the brand owners, the Samsungs, the Panasonics, the Sonys, the LGs. Not anymore. There's a different model emerging now where instead, the startup companies actually look a little bit more interesting to the brand owners. So a company like Sun Chemical worked with Liquivista, a startup company, 
who built a relationship with Samsung. And then, in the end, Samsung acquired LiquiVista. In the process, Sun Chemical never had to try and beat down the door of Samsung and try and understand what was the killer app for LiquiVista's application and what they were developing. They just waited for LiquiVista to get slowly sucked in to the Samsung environment. I didn't need to know, or I didn't need to keep beating my head against that brick wall. I'm going to use someone else to do my hard work by identifying a startup company and working with them. You can network to other startup companies. So find one startup that is working with another growth startup. So BASF that worked with Polyera. Polyera was then, worked, uh, was then working with Thin Film, Thin Film Electronics. So finding this broader ability to grow and grow rapidly on top of the forests and trees that we've already identified. The ACF's got another example. Partnering with Solar City for net zero buildings that incorporate solar, distributed generation. Now, the way to use this is not to just for BASF to work with Solar City, but to get information on the types of technologies and the types of margins that are being made by Solar City when they're deploying these high cost um, but high performance technologies. And last but not least, this corporate polymath. How can we build partnerships that again allow us to more efficiently identify growth? This is one example that I got from uh, Andy Utekuk, uh, who works at 3M, who was going to be here, but, uh, but couldn't make the event. It's new business creation in a sense, but uh, the, the terminology that Andy uses is idea architecting. And it brings together um, what amount to the closest things that exist to entrepreneurial polymaths that exist in 3M's organization from materials, from process, and from marketing to work in a very open way on big needs and what might be possible. Not defining it in terms of incremental, but setting a big target and figuring out what's possible, but bringing breadth and depth to that problem. So this is you know, pretty standard stuff. Yeah, I did core competency sessions and brainstorming sessions and slam some post-it notes on a wall. I do it once a quarter. It's awesome. It's fantastic. Haven't seen a lot of results, but I feel good. Feel fantastic. What is 3M doing that's a little bit different now? How are they broadening this out to true corporate polymath? Well, they're doing the same activity, the same idea architecting with corporate partners. So at least two relationships are now set up between 3M and between other corporations that are out there that take that sit together and create big ideas, serve big needs, and build back from that to identify well, what can we do about it? How can we, build a, how can we build a roadmap to serving this big need? Joint architecting, and the most important thing that speeds this up, they worry about the IP later. There's a realization that if the pie just gets bigger, we all win. We're gonna get a piece of the pie. Let's worry about the IP later and not let us slow us down. Speed, and speed to growth. Because remember, that's what we're targeting. Speed and growth, and getting as efficient as possible on identifying the domains, finding the forests, finding the trees within those forests, and using every tool we can. Partnership, growth scouting, startups, 863, whatever relationship you can build, they are the tools that we're all using already, but it's just a matter of changing the framework and getting back to something that truly drives growth. We want to be this. We want to be a whole bunch of polymaths sitting around sharing great ideas, but polymaths with kind of an NGV ROI view, kind of making money, a little bit closer to this, you know, a whole bunch of Steve's sitting around. The most important thing to take away from your path to full Steviness is a quote from another polymath that's out there. We build too many, too many walls and not enough bridges. I invite you all, during the course of the next two days, to build a lot of bridges, to find your inner and outer Steve, to build partnerships and to find growth, and to scout for that growth through the forests and the trees. Thank you for your time, and I'll be very happy to take any questions.